Welcome to Care Talk, America's home for incisive debate about healthcare business and policy. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. David, what do we have today to talk about? John, I have three numbers for you today. 988. That's the mental health hotline. It's now in operation across the country. Let's talk about what it means for mental health and prevention of suicide in the United States. Super important topic, David. Let's dig in. So, John, what is the 988 hotline? Well, it's, it's, it's actually kind of a remarkable thing. We spend so much time talking about what doesn't work in politics. This is actually a, a pretty cool thing. It's a number that will is a national emergency number that you can call if there's a some form of you or someone nearby is having a mental health crisis. It's the equivalent of a 911 call that people would typically use for fire and police, but it is specifically designed to connect you or a loved one or someone who just is going through a mental health crisis to a trained counselor so that we can start to correctly cue the help that people need who are having some sort of a mental health breakdown or crisis. Well, John, not only is it like the 911 in the sense of an easy number to remember and to call in a crisis, but it also hopefully is going to pick up some of the traffic that's currently going to 911 that really shouldn't. Because a lot of people, when they have a crisis of any kind, they call 911. And that's sometimes that's going to bring out an armed response that is well, not necessarily you know, going to be appropriate. Currently, that is what people do. If there's a, if there's, if you're going through an emergency, uh, th- th- it is a natural thing to call 911. I mean, 20% of all co- cop police time is, a, is, is, a, is, is, according to some research, spent on transporting people who have mental health issues. Um, it, we have a, 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 obviously a lot of attention appropriately spent to bad shoots or where a cop it kills someone for uncertain and for inappropriate reasons. Twenty-five percent of all the people shot by cops are are part of are experiencing some form of a mental health crisis, and police and firemen are not trained to deal with mental health crises. And so, I think this is this is appropriate. But no, it's a, it is the is the equivalent of nine one one, but to get you the help you need when you're when you or somebody else is going through a mental health crisis. Now, John, 911 has all sorts of infrastructure behind it. So if you call it, there's going to be an operator who can answer. They can dispatch the right people. There's a lot of money uh, behind it. And mental health, as we've talked about, you know, is is not really like that. You know, it's not coordinated. We spend a lot of money on it, but it's still, you know, not so well resourced. So just putting that number out there, you know, isn't going to help by itself. In fact, it may, might make things worse if they start getting the volume. Well, you're such a skeptic. I mean, classic, oh, classic. I mean, we have like you know, the equivalent of about $24 million historically associated with this sort of telephonic support because it's not like people haven't tried to set up suicide uh, and, and, and mental health lines in the past. I mean, you've got, you've got, but, but it's, I think it's 24 million roughly that the feds have historically spent on this. And this bill, the bill that actually supported a national 988 line is going to create, has created $400 million, count them, David, of funding for this critical crisis. Now, I, I agree with you. I think that I'm, I'm a little skeptical that we're going to turn it on and it's going to work perfectly, but let's, but don't, don't poo poo this incredible investment in mental health infrastructure and frankly, emergency support and connection that actually I think could be make quite a material difference in people's access to help. Well, John, we do have a, a good record in this country of being able to handle uh, crisis issues well. And so with some attention focused here, uh, which is appropriate, I think we may be, it may be uh, possible to do something about it. There's about 200 local crisis centers uh, that are part of this network. And then there's another 16 backup centers in case they're all busy. And so if somebody's calling, you know, you want them to get through. At the moment, only a little over half of people are getting through to these hotlines that you're describing. So th- this is actually a big deal. I'll also mention that, um, you know, the 988 is a phone number for people of our age, uh, John, to call, but you can also text it and y'all can also do a chat there um, as well. So those are uh, other possibilities. But again, I think I think the numbers you're thinking about, I think that of the suicide hotlines, only 56% of the time are people really connected to a non, a non in, in person. 
And I think even less have their text responses. And I can't imagine a sadder um, situation than someone who's asking for help is having suicidal thoughts or is in a suicidal frame of mind and can't get connected. I mean, this, this massive federal investment to support local connection to trained healthcare providers. I mean, I, I th- mental health providers, I think this is really, really exciting, David. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that you're a skeptic. I'm not, ske- John, you're not surprised that I'm a skeptic. Let's not, uh, let's not put false, uh, you know, surprises out there. And I misspoke before. It was, I think, something over 56% of the, the texts that were answered, 83% of the phone calls, but still that's, you know, one in six that's not being answered. That's not, that's not good enough. Now, the $400 million is good versus the $24 million. And my understanding is that, you know, to make this sustainable, there is a mechanism where states can put a little fee, one of those hated fees, you know, on cell phone bills, which is the same one, same way that 911 is financed. Now, to date, yeah, to date, there have been four states that have done it, a couple where it's under consideration. So on the one hand, well, you can I, say I think, that's I good because some people a, have done a, it. On the other hand, you can say, well, you know, six I states out of 50 is not, not so good. What's, quiet, what's your sense of where that will Bipartisan consensus that we are going through a an American crisis of deaths of despair that are hitting you know, it is a bipartisan challenge. And I think you're seeing agreement across the aisle and progress towards financing and supporting a new investment in in mental health resources. I mean, when you think about it, David, deaths of suicide are going up every year. I and mean, it's unclear how many overdoses are, are actually some form of passive or active suicide. You know, if we can intervene, um, you know, only 7% of suicides that are unsuccessful, uh, suicidal attempts, lead to death by suicide. So 93% of those um, don't get, get the help they need in some form or fashion and don't die by suicide across those. So suicide is not inevitable. So imagine if we can, can create a, a lot of social alternatives to give access to people who are going through profound crisis. We're going to actually... Yeah, and, and you've seen it with certain even health systems. Henry Ford Health System in in Detroit uh, it had a seventy percent reduction of suicides in their active catchment area because they focused on getting people who are depressed and near suicidal the resources they need. This is a this is a starter four hundred million dollar investment. I think you're going to see billions behind it, and I do think there's a bipartisan consensus um, a to invest the money. And an, and, a, and, and an increasing awareness that we actually know how to solve and treat a lot of mental health issues. We just haven't been getting people the help they need. Well, John, you are you know you can accuse me of skepticism, which is fine. I'm happy to stand to be accused of that, not cynicism. But I am a little cynical about anything that's bipartisan. You know, I don't think it means it means that you've got people on both sides of the aisle that are interested, and in it. it may not be for the same reason. And I don't think we should leave this topic. Uh, without talking about how firearms are related to it. And one is that when we talk about suicide, a reason that a lot of suicides are successful is because people have ready access to a firearm in the U.S. It's just, you know, right at hand. It's, it's uh, a lot harder. You know, that's, that, is, that is a reason why a lot of these are successful here and they, they wouldn't, wouldn't have to be. That's one thing. And another one is that, you know, when uh, there's a push for stronger gun control, usually the pushback is, well, the problem is, you know, somebody's mentally ill. We got to keep the guns away from mentally ill. We need to deal with mental illness. Well, I'll take illness. it. I'll take so the fact that I think we that's are seeing increasingly the support. The majority of Americans uh, support red know, flag laws. Those are the laws that actually um, give 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 the law enforcement folks the ability to take violent take take the weapons away from folks who might turn violent. That was part of the most recent bipartisan successful compromise bill on gun control it didn't gun safety it didn't get us everything you and i would have liked but that's a material help in states that have a red flag law you've seen a, a material decrease in some of these incidents that were easily preventable and predictable because people had violent thoughts and had access to weapons so there's no question that the proliferation uh easy access to guns and ammunition um, without accountability, I mean, it, it, we 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 it, it, a day doesn't go by. It feels like without a uh, a, a horrible shooting of some form or fashion, some 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 form in some part of the United States. But but let's not. But don't skip over the fact that um, since nineteen the six nineteen sixty three Mental Health Act, that the Kennedy Act, 
we really haven't as a country had our act together with regard to investment in mental health. And whether it's the $400 million that's being spent on this infrastructure that's needed to make sure that no suicidal call go or text goes unanswered, or the billions that are actually part of that bipartisan gun safety bill that passed recently, that'll go towards expanding community uh, uh, mental health centers uh, that we, I think, are, are, are in, a, in, a, in a new positive age of investing in the infrastructure. Because again, we know how to, I mean, these are people, people with mental health issues, behavioral issues, uh, depression. We know how to actually treat folks. We just have not created the infrastructure to get them this help they need. And I think this, this, this fir- the first hotline uh, is, is an awesome first step. And obviously billions have to go behind it. But I, I do think I, I, I'm, I'm much more optimistic than I would have been a few years ago that we're going to actually get people the resources they need. Well, John, let's end on that optimistic note. We've been talking today about the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, which has uh, gone into effect in July of 2022. So that's it for yet another edition of Care Talk. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. If you like what you heard or you didn't, please subscribe on your favorite service.